Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, no matter where you are. Uh, we have a guest on the show. Uh, welcome to Ge uh, Greg Kilstrom. Welcome, Greg. Yeah, looking forward to talking with you both here. Um, yeah, so Greg joins us from um, uh, a company called GK5A. He's also a podcaster, so he's going to give us marks out of 10 at the end of this. <laughs> Uh, for our I wasn't aware schools. I'd be graded here, Colin. I, uh, <laughs> I realized I have something else I have to do. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And one is to change your shirt, mate, I think. That's right. Is, I don't know if it's entirely appropriate for podcasts. Lumberjack Chic is uh, is back <laughs> in, is it not? Uh, go wrong with a good know. flannel. So uh, Greg is uh, an author, a speaker, uh, a consultant, uh, and focuses on customer experience and uh, marketing. Uh, but he particularly looks at life from the technology side. Um, and obviously with AI and everything else that's happening, we thought it was uh, appropriate to get somebody to come on the show and uh, talk about that. He runs a really good podcast, um, which if you haven't had a chance to listen to it, I would suggest that you do. It's called the Agile Brand Podcast. And I believe you've even beaten me, Greg, in you've written 11 books, isn't it? There's a few. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I've I've only written eight. I'm starting to feel inadequate now. <laughs> it's not a competition. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, the the conversation that we wanted to have with you, Greg, was uh, we've talked a lot on the show about um, you know the change that we're seeing happening in customer experience and the fact that you know. Um, in my view, uh, a lot of the next competitive battleground is going to be in the uh, arena of providing a proactive experience. Okay, and you know we heard we hear a lot of predictive uh, analytics and all that type of stuff. Um, but you know, so that's what we're going to hopefully talk a bit about today. But maybe I could just start off by getting your a, a sense from you from a sort of a, a global position of where do you think organizations are with uh, the introduction of AI and technology and, you know, what are some of the common issues that you're seeing uh, around? Sure, sure. And I'll, I'll kind of relegate my answers to the marketing and customer experience realm because there's, yeah, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot in a lot of areas, sure. but you know, to kind of, to kind of focus on those, you know, I think that there's a lot of talk about it. We can, you can't escape, you know, someone mentioning chat GPT on a daily basis and, and things like that. Sure. But, you know, when it really comes down to implementing, that's a whole, that's a, that's a whole other thing. So, you know, I think sure. every organization is looking at how AI is going to make sense. Many have made some, um, I would say, fairly big statements on they're going to adopt it and it may affect uh, the workforce um, because a lot of the work, you know, depending on the stats you look at, between 30 and 50 percent of some people's jobs yeah. are repetitive tasks that could be replaced by by AI, things like that, you know, so that's on the, the internal, you know, focus on the external, the customer expectations, even very, very large brands are having a hard time meeting the expectation of, you know, whether it's next day delivery from an e-commerce platform to, I just want everything personalized and I want a brand to know who I am, what I did five minutes ago when I talked to the on the phone to your customer service rep. I want the website to understand that and the mobile app to do the same. And I don't want to get an email advertising a product that I just bought yesterday. And, you know, so consumers are continually channel switching and, and, and they're frustrated um, in this. And so brands are looking at how do we use AI um, to predict what a customer is going to want? How do we use AI to generate hyper personalized content, whether it's images or text. And also how do we use AI to just automate things that people don't need to do and they should focus on on other things. So all that to say, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of ex exploration. There's not a lot of implementation at the moment. There's some sure. organizations that are a little further ahead, but it doesn't necessarily mean if you're a Fortune 50 company, you've, you're doing this. 
it, it kind of just depends on where you are in that maturity scale. And, and it's a wide range. I work with a lot of very large organizations and some are, you know, I'm, I'm impressed at how far along they are. Some are really sure. lagging behind and, and they know it. So maybe a non-answer to your question, but kind of, you know. Such, yeah, such no. I, I always remember I, I um, used to work in corporate life and uh, going back about 25 years, we were implementing this system. And everybody's view was once we implemented this system, life would be better. It was going to make teas and coffees for everybody. It was going to give everybody sandwiches at lunchtime. And, you know, I guess the, the reality is, it's, is, is it never does, never does that. So it, it makes me wonder where, you know, uh, so what level of readiness do you think these organizations are for this this type of thinking because there's a there's a difference and i guess the point i'm trying to get to is there's a difference between the the thought process and the actual implementation and what you know really what it will produce you know and the danger is is people's thoughts of what it's going to do and what it actually does can be very different so yeah before you answer that greg uh, like i want to i want to take colin's question and, and kind of uh get a little bit more specific on it because you mentioned a, a few things in your answer that maybe people out there in the universe are just are kind of understand this better than than I do or I suspect not though I, I suspect that there are a lot of people we're talking about AI and kind of using AI as a linguistic substitute for magic wand um, like oh AI can do you know Wingardium Liviosa like it can do anything you, you mentioned three specific usages of AI. I want to slow us down and, and talk through each of those because I do think that would be very useful for people to understand. Like there, there's different, again, as I understand it, there's different types of AI and they can be used for different types of tasks. And I think focusing our thinking around these different specific types of tools might be really helpful as people try to chart where this is going. So the three things I heard you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, there's a generative AI. So this is stuff like ChatGPT. Um, and I forget the, the popular one that makes images, but uh, Dolly. Or Dolly or, yeah. Yeah. So there, there's AI that can be used to, to generate stuff, to write essays for you or to write ad copy or to generate images. There's also um, maybe predictive AI. So this, this, as I understand it, it would be like kind of taking big data and kind of modeling it out in really sophisticated ways to better predict than our old statistical models. And then the third one um, that I heard you mention was automation, um, which is taking routine tasks. And have I adequately summarized those? Is there anything you want to add yeah. to those and am I missing any? So I, I would add one to it and it's kind of a, it's, it's related to, to predictive, but I, I, I separate personalized customer journeys as its own category. So I, I, wrote, a, I wrote a book recently on AI and, and marketing and just, you know, the three categories you mentioned are exactly as, as they are, but, you know, I added the personalized customer journeys and, and perhaps relevant to this discussion too, just because it, it can pull in a lot of those elements, but I think it's something that organizations need to focus on more um, for you know, reasons already discussed and probably to be discussed. <laughs> so. so let me channel you back then to Colin's question. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, back to Colin's question. How well are organizations currently prepared to cope with these four different types of AI? And then who's doing yeah. it well? Have you seen, you don't need to name anybody, but how are people using it poorly in, in your experience? Where, where are we going? Yeah, definitely. So I'll, you know, I'll, try to take them in order there. So I think generative AI is getting all the oxygen right now. And so, you know, everybody, and there's some really cool stuff. I mean, you know, there's, there's the, the chat GPTs and, and Bard and mid journey and, and all those things, but there are also a little, what I would call a little more practical implementations of, you know, Adobe came out with, I know it's in beta still, but a Photoshop, like, uh, shameless plug for Adobe, but like, it's amazing to type into Photoshop, like, take this background out and put something else in. Like, I mean, I was using Photoshop in 1.0 days before they had layers and all this stuff. Someone out there probably knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, 
so like to, to see this evolution is amazing and it's a it's an actual practical application that doesn't replace a person but it makes a person do their work better and so but that said there's a lot of issues there with intellectual property with you know with all kinds of other things that people need to be really careful of and people at large brands um i forget the name and i might not have mentioned it anyway but someone entered some code into chat gpt from i think a very large consumer brand a month ago or so and so chat gpt now has this organization's code in it because unless you tell it not to store it it does and so you know there's there's some real issues um at stake here so that said again it's getting all the attention and it and in some ways rightfully so but so so that's but I, I don't think companies are using it at scale right now. They're using it very carefully, testing and, and stuff like that. Um, on the predictive side, to some degree, companies have been using this for a lot. Any any organization that's you know done a propensity model or you know churn prediction or, or anything like that. I mean, the other thing here is that AI has been around for thirty plus years in name and you know in in practice before that. So. Anytime you do if this, then that, any kind of algorithm, any kind of anything, that's AI. So broadly speaking, you know, organizations have been using this stuff for a long time. But real, like the predictive analytics, even some simpler things in like, you know, Google Analytics or, or other things like that, you know, it's a little more recent. But, you know, real like predictive analytics, the exciting part is when you tie that into, okay, let me make a decision to show one thing, not the other to a customer or, you know, to make operational decisions or things like that. Uh, I would say, you know, there's there's good adoption of, of some of that um, simply because, again, the prediction, you know, or, you know, any company of any size has to predict something at some point. So, you know, there's there's some there's some adoption there. The newer version of that, I, I would say there's OK adoption of it. Um, so the the task automation, the you know workflow automation, that's probably the oldest um, of all of them in real use within organizations. So you know any company that does, has project management software software that routes a task from one party to another, again very simple implementation of AI, but it's technically AI. So you know that stuff's been around for decades, really. You know as 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 much as software has helped organizations run you know the internal operations. Where it's getting more exciting is mixing prediction with automation and mixing generative AI with automation, because then all of a sudden I'm tasked with writing a bunch of content, but here's an automated um, system that supplies me with something that I can edit as a human. You know, we want somebody to review it, but it's a, it started already. It's like, 80% of the way there, I'm using what humans do best, which is strategy and just sort of abstract thinking to, to make it as good as it can be, and then passing it on to another automated process. And then last, last the fourth category, just that personalized customer journey, I think it, it doubles down on all of the above of let's automate what we show when, where, how to customers, let's automate the internal processes, let's generate personalized content to that customer along the way based on where they are, what's going on with them, all of that. Companies are, I think we're in early days of doing that well. There's, you know, there are customer journey orchestration platforms that do this and that I've worked with them for years, but not a lot of companies are using them broadly. They're using them for specific areas of the business. There's marketing automation has been around for a while. So, you know, you buy something or you abandon your cart and you get an email follow up. Like that's, very simple automation but you know that's been around for a while but that stuff is getting more sophisticated and aware of what's going on on different channels or even in brick and mortar stores versus online and stuff too so i'd say you know that's getting there but it's still it's it's i would say it's early days with that so i know that was a lot but. no that was that was very helpful um i mean the, the couple of things i i would pull out of, of what you said um I, I think that your your insight and, and again correct me if I'm mischaracterizing you. Uh, several of these types of AI improvements um, are incremental. They may be large increments, but you know 
we've always had, you know, as long as we've had statistics, we've had predictive analytics, you know, that's kind of what a regression model is that you learned in ninth grade. Um, But it's like better now and that can pull in more data. And the generative AI is maybe partly sucking up the oxygen, I think in part because it's user friendly, anybody can get on there and, and do it. But then also that feels like a qualitative shift to me. Like this is something that is very new and we couldn't approximate it before. Um, and so that's kind of new and exciting, but all the rest of these are, are, are improvements on stuff that we were already doing. Is that kind of characterized? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, you know, I think there, there's also, there's, there's lots of sort of intersecting trends here. And so, right. yeah. you know, I think this, this concept of self-service and from a customer perspective and a concept of the citizen developer, low code, no code, whatever you want to call it of, I'm not a software engineer. I mean, in my day, I've written a a few lines of code here and there, but I'm not an engineer. But me, as a non-technical person, I can go in and basically create an application by dragging and dropping things. So, you know, so you've got the internal teams now able to make their own software and you've got customers able to do very complex actions as a customer that used to take talking to five people on a phone tree and so on and so forth. Yeah, I love that. So, so how many organizations then would you say are looking at AI from or through the lens of cost saving or, or through the lens of improving the experience? Yeah, I mean, so with the with the kinds of companies that I, I work primarily in like the Fortune 1000 space, so I would say I might be a little bit off on this. I would say all of them are. <laughs> Like right. there, I don't think there is a company that isn't at least curious about this. And I would say most of them are doing something about it, even if it's a proof of concept or, or a test, but they are right. all looking at this because they're all, I mean, there were either. Well, recent I mean, yeah. Sorry. I, so I, when you say looking at it, I, so for me, there's and and it could, the answer could be both by the way. Yeah. You know, for me, you've got one part of it, which is we can use it to reduce our costs because we can automate the tasks and everything else. And yeah. there's another part of it, which is, and we can, you know, um, provide a more personalized customer experience or uh, an improved customer experience. Uh, I guess I, uh, I'm, and let me explain my bias. I worry that traditionally most organizations would put more energy into reducing the costs than they would do on improving the experience. And I guess I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, and I think there's a win-win in this, in in that if customers can do more self-service and get what they need and they can, you can expand share of wallet because you understand the customer better, you're at least, you're making more money from the customer. You're potentially saving money because they're not t- they're not tying up phone lines and and doing all that stuff if they're able to self serve. So I think sure definitely agree that I think more more effort right now is being put on cost savings simply because of the economic climate and you know maybe we're getting out sure. of inflation and all that stuff, but we're still there. So you know there's a lot of there's a lot of focus on cost savings and there's also been some big announcements of companies that aren't going to rehire the thousands of, comp- of of employees that they laid off because they, they said the, the quiet part out loud, like they said, because of AI. And, sure. you know, this is what we all as humans fear is that the, the robots are going to, you know, take our jobs. But it's, it's, you know, I don't, I'm an optimist when it comes to this stuff for the most part, but it is happening. And um, so I think to your point, I think more companies are looking at it from cost savings, but I think the smart ones are trying to do both and they're trying to get, yeah. get more more revenue better lifetime value they're moving to subscription models as well and you know the self-service stuff i mentioned that you know so they're they're kind of wrapping all that up in how do we do this the only way to do it at scale is using ai tools and probably a combination sure. of all four and, and stuff like that sure and going back to the original um original conversation we were having it how much of that is based around the goal of trying to provide a proactive experience? I mean, are are people sort of talking about, well, we need to provide a proactive experience, therefore we need the technology to 
you know, the, or the technology enables us to do that? Or is that just sort of pie in the, pie in the sky stuff? You know, no, I, I think they are. I, I mean, again, not, not all, not all organizations, but I think the, the, the more sophisticated and the more forward thinking ones are because they see again, customer expectations being, I, you know, I can, I can go to this other company and get what I need where I want it. And sure. if I have my smartphone in front of me, I'll use that. Or if I'm in front of my laptop or if I want to walk in the store, I, I get it that way. And so I think they're seeing that there's actual revenue opportunity and there's also risk mitigation to, you know, the, the things that the CFOs care about. It's like, there's, there, there's an actual cost to not doing it at this point because it's so easy for customers to switch everything's subscription model. So it just cancel one and start another one. So it's like, there's gotta be a compelling reason to keep people, you know, I saw a statistic the other day where the experience that customers have is as important to like a majority of customers as the product and service itself. You know, that like, sure. just, I mean, I've seen that a million times in the last month or so. So it's like, sure. I glossed over it. But the first time I saw it, it's like, that's really, you know, th that's something, you know, to, to note. And, I don't know if I feel the same way, but it's, you know, it's, it's certainly, it means something, right? Yeah, no, no, I agree. I, I, I think it's just, you know, um, we, we, I, you must've heard of the American customer satisfaction index. Um, yeah. We, you know, and we had somebody on the show a couple of, a um, couple of months ago talking about the results. We, we typically have one every couple of times a year. Um, and, you know, we know that, customer sat in the States is a 17 year low, which I find ironic given all of the attention uh, and everything else that's sort of been plugged on it. So I, I, I again, it, it sort of, it just speaks to the, the difference between lots of organizations going, we need to improve our customer experience and the implementation uh, of whether they're actually sort of capable. So, so having said that, let's let me get back to my 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 other question, which um, we we didn't cover, which is so you, you know what what do you I'm trying to draw this sort of distinction between the yes we've got AI it's going to be wonderful and we've you know it's going to be brilliant and tomorrow's going to be brilliant but this is where we are and this is what we need to be putting in place. Sorry, Ryan, I'm getting very practical on you, mate. You know, right. the, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> draw us back out into theory in a little while. absolutely yeah. so you know this is the future but this is yeah. where we are so what 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 what's your view on the state of readiness of organizations today yeah yeah i mean we're definitely you know there's the gartner hype cycle there's the shiny object syndrome like whatever yeah. you want to call it. like we're definitely there with with ai and but you know unlike some other recent um fads and and uh, and things like that I, AI is not going away. I mean, again, it's been here for decades. It's not going away. Sure. How extensively it's used and how much generative is used versus another, you know, that that's that could be up for, for debate. I think there are definitely some things that organizations need to have in place that they don't often have in place. And even very large organizations, sometimes being bigger makes it more difficult. Um, so, you know, from a data perspective, you have to have data and you have to have unsiloed data, you have to have good data, you know, many adjectives could be um, added there as well. Um, your data house has to be in order to do AI well. And and that's, that is, again, uh, the larger you are, it's almost the worse it can be because you're spread out geographically and divisions sure. and products, so on and so forth. So like, sure. that is the, the organizations that I work with that are trying to get ahead and, and catch up in some cases and, and, and all that, they are focusing on how do we get our, our data in you know, our data house in order. And, and then, you know, I think the other part of this is, you know, you mentioned, you know, the, which I've heard many times as well is, you know, when, when we get this platform, when we get the software, then, you know, then we can really start working or whatever, you know, it's, it's people process platform, right? And that's sure. like the platform is always thought of as like the thing that's going to solve all our problems, but the people's sure. people in the processes are what either stands in the way or actually makes them successful depending on, or somewhere in between often. But, you know, that's, sure. those, are, those are the sticking points. And I think 
that's another thing that I do with organizations is, you know, I've got to know the technology. Like I have to be able to talk tech to technology as well as marketing and CX sure. people. But I work on the process stuff and make sure that the people become okay with the process because it takes changes. You know, when we're talking about, you know, to go to the personalized customer journey aspect alone, you've got departments that don't talk with each other that are yeah. almost incentivized to keep people on their, in their little fiefdom or whatever. And now all of a sudden you've got to say, well, you know what? Everybody needs to work together and it's really what the customer needs wherever they happen to be. And, and all those kinds of, it's a huge like mental shift. And then it's also a learning curve of like, how do we think about things more broadly in a customer has this entire life cycle as opposed to my job is to send emails and get people to buy a product. And that's all I do every day. Like that's a big shift for, for teams that are, that are just kind of ingrained and incentivized and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it, it sort of worries me and let me test another theory out with you. It worries me that organizations are going to implement their system strategy. And I hope this isn't the case, but yeah, or, or, or AI solutions based upon the silos as opposed to across the whole customer journey. Uh, I was actually, I was speaking about this on a webinar the other day. You know, if, if you go back to when the, the internet was first found, you know, amount of corporates I went into, the, the, every bloody department had their own internet with their own image and everything else. And then they spent the next five years bringing it all together right. so it would provide one you know you know and it and it took forever to do and i'm thinking i'll lay your money this is going to happen with ai am, am i am i right or yeah i mean that's definitely a i, I think the so there's two ways to look at that i mean one is to do it intentionally and roll it roll ai out across platforms or teams or divisions or you know however however you look at that and be intentional sure. about it to say you know what Right now, it's too much to break down silos and, and unify everything, but we're going to do it one channel or one team, you know, at a time. It's yeah. another to do. I think what you're what you're inferring as well is to not do it intentionally and to everybody go in their own direction. And then you've got, you know, there's there's the organizations that have like five instances of Salesforce or Adobe or whatever, not even on the same one, just using sure. a different, like there are separate licenses for these multi-million dollar products yes. and people, you know, just using them completely differently and all that. So yes. you have the same, you know, you run the same risk. And and that is not to say that that's not happening probably in a, in a lot of orgs right now, because everybody wants to be, there's also this like, you know, everybody wants to be first. They want to be like, oh, well, we're going to use AI well in this org and then everybody's going to do what we do. But there's like five other teams that have that same thought process and one hand yeah. doesn't talk to the other. So I do, yeah. I, that is a fear. I think that, and a very real, you know, that's a very real possibility unless there's someone kind of orchestrating that from a process, you know, an organizational standpoint. Yeah. And, and that's where for me, it's like the, uh, the, uh, be some of the behind the question about the state of readiness, because it, it depends on how you look at the customer experience. So, you know, if, if you are a VP or, or of, of customer experience and you've got an, you know, you, you are looking across the organization by definition, this is an opportunity for you to bring all of that up together and to, to unify in one big, uh, one big AI. Um, but the, but the other side it follows as well, which is, you know, if you're a decentralized corporate where everybody's allowed to make their own bloody minds up on everything, you can guarantee it's going to be that everyone's going to have their own way of doing it. Uh, and yeah. some people are going to use it for headcount reduction and some people are going to use it for this and they're not going to talk to each other and, you know, all, all help. Yeah. Space. Well, and that gets, you know, it's, I mean, dangerous is probably too strong a word in most cases, but, you know, it does get dangerous because, you know, we are talking about training, you know, AI, like machine learning models on sets of data. And, you know, they get, you know, bias in, in AI is a very real, very big challenge and, and, and problem, even if it's not 
ethically an issue it's still you know if you're if you have all these siloed ai models looking at things they're looking at one piece of the picture and then you start yeah. unifying these things and you've got all these parts of the picture that don't really like you've it's kind of a wasted investment in other words let, let alone yes. the potential ethical implications if it's done wrong yeah. but even if yeah. it's done right <laughs> but it's siloed yeah. you kind of lose you lose the, the the value of the investment because it's not looking broadly at, at what customers actually want and need across channels or, or products and stuff yeah. like that. I'll tell you the, the good thing, mate. Do you want to hear about the good thing? What? <laughs> it keeps you it keeps you in a job. How about that? <laughs> Fair enough. Because people, yeah. need, people need to use your services. Not replaced by AI <laughs> at the end of all this. Right. Right. Rick, let, let me ask you a, a practical question. Not, not because I care, but just because I want to shame Colin. Um, <laughs> so uh, Colin is, is very much a tech enthusiast. Um, I'm a little bit more cynical about this stuff. Uh, I, I look at you know recent history in business and see a lot of this shiny object syndrome where um, I mean, that. Uh, what was the latest one? Um, blockchain. Um, people were so excited about blockchain and blockchain was about everything. And it turned out to be a, a very narrow solution for a very, very small set of problems. Now, I don't think AI is that, right? I, I think AI is, is tremendously flexible. We, we already mentioned there's at least four different flavors of it. They can then interact. So there's now lots of, of things. So I don't I don't think it's that. But I do think there's a real risk of companies kind of choosing a particular AI implementation or solution and then, you know, using that as a hammer for whatever they see in front of them. So what advice would you give to firms who want to avoid blockchaining AI and um, kind of forcing a solution that, that looks shiny onto the wrong set of problems or, you know, over investing in something that uh, is going to end up not being like, what, what's your like, like big two, three, four bits of advice for how to do this right as this monumental change is coming up on all of us? Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you don't mind, I might revise the, the premise just slightly. And so sure, um, that'd be great. Yeah. I'm not a blockchain expert by any means, but I, I would liken it more to, um, I may offend someone out there listening, but I would liken it to the relationship between it's kind of our role. But yeah, if you want to offend somebody, that's yeah, fine. Sorry, too. Right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. um, you'll get hate mail on my behalf, but um, <laughs> okay, it, it's more the relationship between cryptocurrency and blockchain than it is blockchain. It's like blockchain is just technology and it does, it actually does what it does pretty well. Um, going all in on Bitcoin or Dogecoin or, or whatever, like that's a slippery slope and many have made millions maybe and, and virtually and, and actually, but um, on it. But so to me, that's where, you know, again, I chat, chat GPT is very cool, but it's like when I hear people get too excited about a tool that's built on AI, which AI is a, is broader than, um, most technologies that we even talk about. And so I think maybe that's the first, the first piece of advice is let's be specific about, you know, it's not just let's do AI, like, you know, let's build an intranet or a website or whatever. It's like, okay, let, what, what are the problems that we actually want to solve? And chances are there's a lot of ways that AI might be able to solve that. But, you know, let's, let's first focus on what are the you know what are the things again that humans don't do well or or don't want to do sometimes it's both but we're not good at repetitive tasks we're not good at error checking large volumes of data we're not good at making relationships within large volumes of data if any of those things are a problem in your organization or you could do your job better if you had help with that then think about okay, well, how could AI help? Like to me, that's that's really the the first step. And instead of we have a you know a solution in search of a problem, which is off. I think what you're touching on here is like okay, well, uh, you know, because I've heard other organizations be like, well, we've we've heard about these Chat GPT. Yep. Yep. What do we do with it? You know, we it's don't like want to be left problem. behind. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, I would definitely start there. I, you know, I think to go back to the data, the data point, I think you've got to figure out, you know, what, what are you, how are you storing customer data? You know, how do you have access to 
different siloed sets of data. That, that would definitely be a number two. I would look at teams maybe as a number three as far as are your teams talking with one another? Do Does everyone have only a, a small piece of a window into the customer's life and expectations and all those kinds of things? Like start breaking those things down. I mean, any organization that's at least looked at customer experience, I think at least has a head start because they've they've tried to do a journey map and tried to map, you know, what they're seeing and feeling and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, and then, you know, the last thing I would say would be, it's okay to start small. And in fact, it's preferable to start small. Um, you don't want to get, in, you know, these digital transformation projects that last three years and have a, you know, 20% success rate. The reason why they have such a low success rate is that they set these big goals, uh, you know, years out and see no progress incrementally. Start small, even if it rolls out with one siloed team, do it, but do it intentionally and intentionally to roll it out across across teams and, you know, find the wins. And maybe your first guess is wrong. But to me, I'm a very a huge proponent of agile principles and, and, and approaches. And so to me, you know, there is no such thing as failure if you learn. So, you know, you got to start somewhere. Sure. Yeah, no, and I think I think that's a good way of looking at it. So, uh, uh, any other advice that you would you would give, Greg? You know, if somebody's listening to this, they're having conversations internally in the organization. Are they? Is that the main pieces of advice that you would give? Yeah, I mean, I think maybe one one related to like CX measurement. And I think we we circled around this a little bit. Is you know one of the benefits of being proactive, since we're talking about you know proactive uh, customer experience, there is the which I'm sure you know, listeners are familiar with leading versus lagging indicators. And, you know, I think the, to me, the exciting, I come from a marketing background and then I got into CX. So I come a little more from, you know, new customer acquisition and, and all those kinds of things. And a lot of CX measurement from my view, and again, from, you know, looking at it from my, my background appears to be built on lagging indicators like surveys and, and all those things, which incredibly sure. valuable when done well. And when, you know, the measurements are, are done well, but we have a huge opportunity with not only, you know, AI based tools, but other things to get those leading indicators that help us because we've got to accelerate how we deliver customer experiences. So to marry the leading with the lagging indicators in a more meaningful way to me is really exciting. And um, I think it provides a lot of opportunity. Sure. No, that's very good. Yeah. And uh, funny enough, uh, Ryan and I were talking about, uh, proactive measures, which is a we we need to have a separate conversation about. Uh, they saw invite you back on the show and talk about that. Yeah. Ryan, any last thoughts from you? Um, I'm I'm just going to steal some of uh, the things Greg said recently and and pretend they're my own. Uh, I, I think it was great advice. Like the, it, I mean, it, a lot of the advice is practical advice for anything you want to do, but I think it's especially good to reapply it as we're thinking about AI, like focus on the problems you want to solve instead of the shiny solutions that are available to us. Know what those solutions do well. Greg listed off several things that AI does very well. Are those the problems that you're trying to solve? If they are, this might be great. If you've got a different set of problems, you might be using the wrong tool to try to solve them. Um, you know, look for small wins. I think all of those are great advice. This can feel like a very, very big topic. Um, yeah. for businesses that are trying to implement it. I think carving off small parts of this um, and trying to get real practical with what you're trying to do is just a really, really solid advice. So I will encourage people to do that and pretend that I came up with it. <laughs> <laughs> and the only other thing I would add to all of this is, for, for me, I was, I was talking to somebody the other day, and it's a bit like the, um, it reminded me of the stories of the tortoise and the hare. Uh, with all the, you know, all the organizations being here running around doing the stuff, implementing shiny new object. But actually, you got to take a step back. And one of the questions I would I would be asking, which is my usual question, is what's the experience that you're trying to deliver? You know, so if we were to now look forward and we so sort of, now we've got all this technology of what we can do. What actually is the experience that we're trying to deliver? And therefore, how can this enable us to 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 do that? And I, I worry that 
too many organizations run around just doing stuff rather than uh, uh, than anything else. So, so Greg, um, I'm sure people will want to listen to the podcast and uh, your the Agile brand. Uh, and w- what was your book? It was The House of Customers, wasn't it? The House of the Last Customer, one? yeah. House yeah. of the Customer. Uh, and where, where else? Um, so where can people get hold of you if they want to get hold of you? Yeah, so two, two places. I mean, first, you know, I'm very active on LinkedIn. I encourage um, listeners to connect with me there. And then my website, you can get access to the podcast, to books, all, all of that kind of stuff. It's just gregkillstrom.com. Um, and yeah, I would love to um, love to get feedback. Yeah, do you want to spell Kilstrom for our non-Swedish listeners? <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. <laughs> it's a K-I-H-L-S-T-R-O-M. And we're, we'll obviously put everything in the, in the show notes as uh, links in the show notes as well. So Greg, thanks very much for coming on, mate. Thanks, Greg. It was um, a lot of fun. Uh, really interesting conversation. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for having me. Cheers. Thanks so much for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode.